Good morning and welcome to uh, each of you this morning. We are so glad to have you here on this uh, bright Sabbath morning on Saturday morning. We've got people uh, from all over the country um, sharing this space with us, this sacred space with us on this Saturday morning. And this is uh, October the 3rd, 2020. And we've got an exciting program uh, in store for each of us on today. And um, so we want to welcome you to uh, Rainbow Community Praise Center uh, in Fontana, California, and uh, where we each, each Sabbath, each Saturday, provide relevant information to inspire the nation and empower a generation. And we're so excited about what we've been able to do, the contacts and the new friends that we've been able to make all around the country. And so if you would, if you would just take a moment to tell us where you're calling in from, you can indicate it in the uh, chat box on Facebook. Uh, you can indicate it in the chat box on YouTube, or you can indicate it in the chat box on Zoom. So there are three different mediums and you can let us know where you're calling in from. And also while you're doing that, we would ask that you would take a moment to uh, write any praise report that you might have, any testimony that you might have. You can also type that in the chat area and we'll be happy uh, to share that, be happy to pray about that so that uh, we make sure that everybody knows that God is good and his mercy endures forever. God is indeed in the uh, in the business of change. God is still a miracle worker, so we're excited about that. So we've got folks calling in, our dear friend uh, Kenny, Alex, uh, Kenny Anderson from Huntsville, Alabama, Elder Nola calling from Beaumont, California. Somebody's calling in from the land of good and plenty in San Bernardino, California. And uh, Kenny Anderson's got a praise report. I won't take it, they'll mention it a little later. Uh, but uh, we're glad so many are calling in, and of course our speaker uh, will mention him a little bit later uh, in the way of introduction. So uh, welcome to each of you and somebody from, uh, actually my wife, Debbie Thomas, uh, calling in from Fontana, California. Outstanding. So thank you each of you for joining us on today, and we look, at, look forward to some exciting information, uh, good uh, inspiration on on today we are so excited uh just uh got word that uh i wasn't a hundred percent clear but it looks like the aeolians have uh, a new uh, a new album ready and also they are being considered for a grammy we already know they are the world's best choir because they've won that uh, distinction uh, on two occasions on two occasions and so the categories uh, for Grammy consideration are Best Engineered Album, Classical, uh, Producer of the Year, Classical, and then Best Choral Performance, right? So that is outstanding. Uh, our little alma mater in Huntsville, Alabama has been making world news for some time now, actually. And so we are so excited about this Grammy consideration opportunity. And so you be prayerful about that because uh, certainly that puts our school on the map, right? And uh, we're excited about that. And good morning to you, Sister Alberta from Las Vegas. So, so do keep that a matter of prayer, Oakwood uh, Aeolians. At this time, we're going to have our opening prayer. Let it by none other than Elder Philip Gray. Elder, lead us. Father God, we thank you for a wonderful day. Hallelujah. We thank you for all that you're doing, and we thank you for this, uh, for this opportunity that you have given us to uh, be encouraged, to be edified, to be comforted, and to uh, uh, receive some good nuggets uh, that we can apply to our everyday life. We pray that uh, your, your, uh, your uh, commission will be over the service, and we look forward to the good and plenty that you have in store for us. We thank you, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Elder Philip. 
And um, at this time, Elder Nola is going to lead us in our testimony time. And, uh, and uh, Elder Nola, and I think Elder, um, uh, I should say, Kenny Anderson had a uh, praise report. Well, good morning, Saints. Good morning. I trust everybody has a testimony this morning, a testimony of life and the goodness of God. We can't see your video, though. <laughs> We can't see the video? No. Just hear your audio, and your audio is very strong. Very good. It's, um, I'm clicking on it, but it hasn't changed. Okay, don't worry about maybe, it. Maybe somebody else has power. <laughs> Keep it um, going. I am grateful to be alive today, and I see Brother Kenny Anderson is, a, is grateful to be alive today. Is there anyone else that has a testimony for us? Good morning and uh, happy Good morning, Saturday. Sister Kenya. Happy Good Saturday. Good morning. I too am grateful and I just want to quickly thank God for bringing me and my family through another week. And um, he has uh, constantly been a shield all around and about us. Hallelujah. And not just been our protector, but he's also continually providing for us. And so I just give him the praise and the honor and the glory. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Hallelujah. We've got a um, uh, uh, message from Sister Debbie Thomas. She said she's blessed and highly favored. Amen. Amen. Glory. Amen. Any other testimonies? Yes, uh, Elder Philip here. Uh, I'd like to just thank God for, uh, uh, of course, health, uh, yes. uh, life, and strength to yes. be able to uh, get back on track uh, with. Um, with uh, my um, uh, a diet and my and my uh, working out regimen, so that was been, that that was a huge blessing, and uh, I I'm just so grateful for all that he's doing in this season, Amen. and uh, despite what's going on around us, God is still uh, blessing me and my family, Amen. and I give him praise. Amen. He's providing and meeting everybody's needs regardless of what we hear. Yes, indeed. Any other testimonies? He's on the throne. I, I, I'd just like to say I'm, I'm just grateful to be alive, and I thank God for uh, health and strength, soundness of mind, for a, for, for a mind to be productive, uh, the capacity to hear uh, the voice, the Spirit of God speaking to me. Um, I thank God for loving and supportive family and a um, uh, comfortable home. And uh, so God is good all the time. All the time, all the God time. is good. So all I thank time. him. I thank him. Also thank him for this opportunity to reach so many hundreds and thousands. Uh, and we're excited about uh, what we can do here and what we've been doing. That's all right, then. Oh, I've had, I have one testimony. We had... Um, a prayer request from one of my neighbors for her eye surgery. Yes. And just to let all the prayer warriors know that eye surgery went well. She's home. She's recuperating. And um, we expect her to be back in full operation in the next two weeks. Outstanding. So we give God praise for that. Outstanding. What a blessing. Yes. What a blessing. And uh, it's no accident that we've got the eye doctor on today. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so he's going to be able to address our eye concerns. Amen. Very good. So thank you so much, Elder Nola. And uh, this time we will go on to our, uh, our offering. And uh, we, we're, we're excited about what we've been doing here. And I mentioned to you every every week I'm excited about the next next uh, session the next service the next show because I'm just a lifelong learner and I love to learn right and so uh, today we we have uh, dr. Harris talking to us about uh, eye care next week we'll have uh, dr. Milton Brown talking to us about covid uh, just giving us an update on those matters and then uh, Dr. Ken Marino will be on and talking to us about uh, f uh, healing family trauma. And then we will have uh, Los Angeles Council District 8 
Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson. He will be with us on the 24th, getting us ready for elections. And he's going to talk about all of the California propositions. He's going to be uh, talking about um, uh, recent bills uh, Gavin Newsom, Governor Gavin Newsom has passed. And so we're excited, looking forward to that. And then on Halloween, Dr. Judy uh, will be with us, Dr. Judy Bragman. And she is the, uh, the vegan uh, the vegan MD, and uh, she's going to, uh, no, it's a plant-based, I think it's the plant-based MD, I'm getting her moniker wrong, and she's going to be on with us, and so we've got an exciting uh, lineup, I won't even go into November, but November just gets gooder, amen. So uh, so we've been a blessing, uh, we've been blessed by those of you who viewed, those of you who commented and participated, and we want to give you uh, an opportunity to give and to support uh, what we've been doing here. And uh, you can give through uh, Cash App and Venmo. You see the uh, QR codes there on your screen. So um, please support us and uh, bless God as you bless us uh, is our prayer and our request. This time we're going to ask Elder Philip to lead us in our uh, intercessory prayer time. Amen. Uh, well, if you have any uh, prayer requests, uh, uh, please uh, uh, put them up in the chat box and uh, we will uh, note them uh, as uh, we are uh, praying during this intercessory time. And so uh, uh, please do that at this time. I'll be reading uh, scripture, uh, Isaiah 25, 1, and it states, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Amen. Amen. Uh, we are, uh, Brother Kenny Anderson has uh, asked for a prayer for his mother-in-law, Ernestine Tibbs, as cataract surgery on October 8th, and uh, also like to lift up his wife Sonia, who has a birthday tomorrow. Oh wow! Lord. And also praying for covering over her life and for uh, uh, Kenny Anderson's life as well. Also, let's uh, uh, lift up uh, Dr. James Harris, uh, praying for his uh, uh, college uh, freshman. I I reckon that's one of his uh, children. His son Jamie. Mm hmm. Yes, 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 praying for his son uh, uh, who's in college. So uh, if you have any other prayer requests, please uh, uh, have them in the chat box and we will pray for those things. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you are doing in this season. Hallelujah. We thank you for uh, all that you have already done uh, uh, despite um, uh, the current situation uh, of our of our world, and so uh, we just uh, like to lift up all the families who have lost loved ones due to COVID. Uh, we ask that uh, you would be with the families who have lost loved ones at the hands of the police, and we just come against the spirit of white supremacy and racism, and we ask that you would be with all the protesters, the uh, politicians. Uh, our president, lead him and guide him. And also uh, we pray that uh, you would uh, heal him from the COVID-19 that he has contracted. Uh, we ask that you lift up all the COVID-19 patients who are dealing with this virus. And uh, we lift up all of our first responders, uh, public safety. Uh, we lift up uh, the coming election process that, that it will be untainted in the name of Jesus. Uh, we lift up uh, all the work that's been done or, or, or that's being done in our healthcare sector. We lift up all the COVID-19 uh, vaccines and therapies, and we lift up uh, our economy, our, all the small businesses, all those um, affected by this, by this uh, COVID-19 uh, disease. And uh, we lift up our economies, uh, pray that uh, Congress would be able to come to some uh, 
compromised so that resources will get out to those who are uh, in need, uh, all, all the vulnerable populations. We ask that they would receive the resources that they need, all the essential workers, that they would receive all that they need. Uh, we uh, lift up all these things to you and we just pray that uh, you would continue to lead us and guide us through this situation. You have uh, guided us through uh, situations that have arose in time past and you are a faithful God. We know you to be faithful and unchanging. And so we ask that you would continue to guide us through this time. Uh, and we look forward to all that you have uh, uh, in store for us. We lift up Dr. Harris. We lift up all the good information that will be shared on this on this, uh, on this, this Zoom uh, service. And we look forward to uh, applying it to our everyday life. We thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering these prayers and we declare these things done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Elder Philip, for that powerful prayer. Thank you for that. Uh, as we've mentioned uh, week after week since March, uh, we have um, uh, each week decided to uh, give you updates and to discuss uh, matters that relate to Black Lives Mattering and also uh, COVID-19. And this is the season that we're in, and if we're in a season and things are going on and we're not talking about it, that kind of renders us irrelevant because the change outside of us, outside of us, is happening more rapidly than the change on the inside. So that renders you essentially irrelevant. But when you're changing at the same pace at the change around you, that makes you relevant. So, um, and that's not, you know, fad change, but it's, you know, changing to understand and adjust to uh, the various uh, things that are going on in, in society. And just kind of keeping up as opposed to having our heads in the sand. So we've been saying week after week that uh, black lives do matter. And uh, so we are always careful to keep up with updates and what's going on. We saw uh, this week in the uh, presidential debate, uh, <laughs> that's kind of uh, uh, really a euphemism. It's, it's not accurate. It was not a debate, right? Uh, the, the president uh, interrupted uh, Vice President Biden, Biden uh, and uh, Chris Wallace over 120 times. So that's not a debate. That's, not, that's clearly not a debate. But during his debate, um, many things came up, not the least of which was um, his being asked to uh, denounce white supremacists. And so uh, when asked, he uh, said, well, who do you want me to, who do you want me to denounce? And uh, he said, uh, you know, he, he, what did he say? He said, um, he said, uh, they said, poor boy, uh, proud boys. And of course he said, uh, okay, uh, proud boys, uh, stand back and stand down. And they took that as an anthem. And within minutes, within minutes, they had established uh, what you see to the left, t-shirts and and uh, that PB is their regular uh, sign or seal or symbol. And they added stand back and stand by uh, above and beneath it. And so, uh, so, so the president of the United States gave a platform for this racist institution, right? Uh, he gave them access. And then, of course, when asked who they were the following day, he says, I don't know. I don't even know who they are. <laughs> Ah, never heard of it. And we've heard that before, right? He's notorious for those. I don't know who they are. I don't know what they are. I don't know anything about the statements. And uh, of course, we learned that uh, the leader of the Proud Boys is a state leader for the Trump campaign, a state leader for the Trump campaign. And there are multiple pictures with him on there. But, but after a day of refusing to con condemn white supremacists, Trump aims a xenophobic attack against uh, Democratic uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Uh, and he comes against her 
uh, citizenship, right? And her, her citizen, uh, her standing, right? And he says uh, to a Minnesota crowd, Duluth, Minnesota crowd, he says that uh, we, we can't allow her to tell us how to run our country. <laughs> can't allow us to uh, tell us how to run our country. He says, how in the world did she get elected anyway? What is your problem, right, Minnesota? What is your problem? So, so we continue to see this kind of rhetoric coming from this White House. It is tragic and unfortunate, but it is our uh, current uh, reality. So we have to just be mindful and, of course, prayerful and, uh, and do anything else we can do, and that is uh, protesting, writing, policy change, contacting public officials, etc. Also, in the area of Black Lives Matter, we were happy uh, this week to discover that Governor Newsom signs a reparation bill uh, in the state of California. This is California Assembly Bill 3121 uh, that moves uh, descendants of enslaved Americans one step closer to getting restitution. And uh, Assembly Member Shirley Weber, Dem Democrat uh, out of San Diego, is the uh, chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus, and she is the author of the bill. The bill is called the Task Force to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans. And so essentially uh, what this, what this uh, bill did or does is it impanels, it, it, it empowers the state to impanel a nine-member study group that will look at the impact of slavery and uh, how the state of California benefited from it, so forth and so on, and, uh, and bring its findings back in 2023. Bring its findings back in 2023. And so, uh, so that's exciting to, to hear that and to see that. And of course, um, earlier this year, there was another uh, city that did the same. I can't remember what city that was now. Uh, but these things are happening, and so we ought to applaud these things when they happen. And, of course, we are all prone to say uh, this is too little, too late. But I, but I would encourage us to, 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 to celebrate the small measures. I would encourage us to celebrate the small things as we, you know, look for the greater, as we look for the greater good. So, uh, so we do definitely celebrate that. And on to our COVID-19 update. We noticed that uh, globally we have hit uh, 33 million cases and uh, 1 million deaths uh, globally. And the United States, 7.3 million with over 208,000 uh, deaths. So 7.3 million cases in the United States, one of which is uh, our president. And then uh, 2008 uh, deaths, which is tragic. And so uh, as late as this morning, what time does that say? That's just about a quarter to eight o'clock. Um, that's uh, West Coast time, I suspect. Yeah, that's West Coast time. And uh, Trump was obviously hospitalized for coronavirus and uh, receives the um, experimental drug uh, remsitivir. And of course, that's an antiviral, and it's been used uh, with others. And uh, they call it an experimental drug because it, prior to COVID, it hadn't been used with COVID, and that's why it's considered experimental. But uh, this is interesting, and 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 I guess we would, uh, you know, uh, you know, if we're not careful, we could celebrate a guy who has said we don't need, you know, just just kind of has really waved his fists uh, in the face of those scientists, his own scientists, who said, uh, you know, we need to do the social distancing. We need to close down the states and we need to uh, have various restrictions. We need, you know, uh, those kinds of things. And, 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 and sponsoring a variety of riots, uh, not riots, but rallies. <laughs> he sponsored a few riots too. But uh, rallies across the country uh, you know, to make sure he had uh, campaign 
uh, contributions and got his name out there and his message. And of course, um, even after uh, Hope Hicks was discovered positive, they still all got on uh, a uh, aircraft and uh, went on to the next rally to their chagrin now because uh, First Lady Melania Trump is, uh, has tested positive. Senior Presidential Advisor Hope Hicks, uh, Trump Campaign Manager Bill uh, Stepien, uh, Republican National Committee Chairwoman uh, Rona McDaniel, Advisor Kellyanne Conway, Senator Mike Lee, Republican of Utah, Senator Tom Tillis, Republican of North Carolina, Notre Dame President uh, Father John Jenkins. All of them have tested positive. So uh, we don't know what this means. We do know that it has, ha it has slowed down the campaign. We do know that it, it has some um, national security implications. And so we're certainly uh, wanting to remember all of these matters uh, in prayer. And, uh, and certainly there are those who are wishing him ill, but, uh, but you know, we don't do that because we just ask for God's will uh, to be done in this matter. And then on last week, I think uh, we discovered that um, the National Medical Association, which is the oldest uh, organization of black physicians said, wait a minute, if there is going to be a vaccine, we're going to ensure that we test it. And this from the president of NMA, uh, Dr. Leon uh, McDougall, he says, you know, the president's Operation Warp Speed to get a COVID-19 vaccine is all well and good, but we have to do our part to make sure that it is ready for the uh, general public. And I can appreciate their stand on that and applaud them. So again, we uh, encourage you to continue washing your hands, continue using sanitizer, continue keeping uh, uh, remaining social uh, maintaining social distance um, and being careful about being in large settings and uh, and doing what you can to maintain good health and uh, well-being. And as you know, um, I've gotten uh, photos from, uh, I've seen photos on social media from other countries where everything is back to normal. Uh, my wife's cousin sent us a picture from China He's in crowds, you know, of thousands, right? Because everything is back to normal. They've got a lid on COVID-19. They've turned it around. And so uh, take precautions. And uh, by God's grace, this thing will turn around uh, very, very short in very, very short order. Okay? Uh, so we appreciate that. And as you come on, please uh, turn off your uh, videos. Please make sure you, when you're coming on, your videos are turned off so that um, we uh, can only see the, uh, the speakers, all right? And those of you who are helping us with that. So we wanna make sure that uh, we're safe. Um, and uh, now they've got some specialized masks, face masks that actually look that looks so much better, right? <laughs> uh, different colors, match your outfit. Hey, you ever see Nancy Pelosi? Nancy Pelosi's mask always matches what she's wearing. You know, she does it in style with class and distinction. So I appreciate that very much. So this time we want to get ready to introduce our speaker for today. But before we do that, I want to ask that... Uh, I'm going to ask that uh, you encourage your friends to join us, uh, start watch parties uh, on Facebook, on, uh, on YouTube, and however, so that uh, they don't miss this vital, vital information about uh, eye care. And uh, I was telling um, when Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, you can come on now. Uh, I was telling Dr. Harris when uh, we were looking at uh, the subject matter, I said, well, you know, uh, talking about eye health and eye care is not sexy. <laughs> it's not one of those sexy titles, you know. It's not one of those sexy subjects that people are breaking the door down and you get, you know, uh, thousands of, tens of thousands of viewers for. But, but what he said is, uh, it, it, it's not sexy, but when you need an ophthalmologist and you got an eye problem, it's very important. So you don't need them until you need them. 
but uh, thank God he's here today. And uh, I think my wife and I have an ophthalmology appointment uh, in the next couple of weeks or so. And so we've got some good questions that we look forward to asking you in preparation for our, uh, our visit ourselves. But we want to just introduce him uh, formally on today. Uh, Dr. James Harris is ophthalmologist and business owner. In the interest of full disclosure, he is a good friend of mine, and we talk at least three times a month. <laughs> at least three times a month. Uh, he is a classmate of mine from Oakwood, uh, Oakwood University, and uh, the, the great class of uh, 86, and uh, appreciate him. In fact, he was our class sergeant at arms, as a matter of fact. I remember him. I can see, I can see, him, see him sitting on the front row of Oakwood University Church, just like it was yesterday, uh, with, his, uh, with his cords on and all of that, and his uh, graduation regalia. Well, he graduated from Oakwood in, that's not correct, he graduated with um, a bachelor's in uh, chemistry. Summa cum laude. He's a smart friend. I like to have smart friends around me. And uh, he also uh, graduated with a um, uh, medical degree from The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Did internship at uh, Naval Regional Medical Center in Portsmouth, uh, Portsmouth uh, Virginia. Residency in ophthalmology at Ohio State University in Columbus. Clinical fellowship in glaucoma at Duke University Eye Center in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, he has been employed with the uh, United States Navy, uh, uh, ma uh, attaining the rank of Lieutenant Commander, and he was a flight surgeon. Uh, currently, uh, he is a partner at Greystone Eye in Hickory, North Carolina. To his uh, credit and distinction, he is uh, a member of the American uh, Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, the, Northern, the North Carolina Society for Eye Physicians and Surgeons. He is a diplomat in the National Board of Medical Examiners, a fellow of the American Board of Ophthalmology, and was ranked best eye doctor in the Catawba Valley in the, Hick in the Hickory Daily Record, 2010 and 2014. Outstanding, outstanding. So uh, we thank you uh, for being on with us today, um, uh, Dr. Harris, and we are so excited, so excited about uh, our conversation on today. Welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, Thanks sir. for the introduction. Yeah, we uh, thank you for taking a moment out of your uh, busy schedule to talk to us. And, and so the first question that uh, I have for you today, and I'm sure our audience would be interested too, is what made you want to be an ophthalmologist? Why ophthalmologist? Well, <clears throat> well I have to say that the story is interesting. I, uh, I thought... Well, the truth is, and I've, I've only said this out loud in public uh, a few times, and people <laughs> I knew would not judge me, but I truly think that uh, God whispered it to me. All right. Uh, I had, it happened when I was in the 10th grade, and I, got in, I, I didn't have any medical people in my family, mm. and the first thing about it that triggered me was the way it was spelled. Mm. Ophthalmologist has two P's in it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, now that's clever. Uh huh. And so that's the first time I had ever came to my attention. Uh huh. Uh, at later on, I guess it was two years later, I got interested in going to medical school after I uh, was told by a, a good church woman who said, you better go to school. Yeah. I'm like, well, Jesus is coming. <laughs> well, I'll go to school. <laughs> Boy, you better go to school. I said, yes, ma'am. And uh, I thought at one time I'd be afraid of blood, mm. do something clean. But in retrospect, I feel like God whispered that to me um, when I was not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I uh, always thought about doing other things, but I always came back to this. And I can truly say that uh, it, it's an honor, a privilege, and great work if All you can right. get it. All right. Yeah. Outstanding. Outstanding. So are there various subsections or specialties within ophthalmology? 
Yes, there are. So even though the eye is tiny, mm -hmm. at the time that I was trained, uh, you know, at that point I was not a, uh, sufficiently wise to be humble. And I thought, yeah, this eyeball, man, I'm going to study hard. I'm going to know it like the back of my hand. And <laughs> the first month of training, somebody came up to me and said, you recognize that there are more books written on the eye than there are on the heart. Wow. And at that moment, I knew that I uh, had to, be, to buckle down and pay attention. Yeah. So, yes, there are subspecialties in ophthalmology. We divide up the eye in different, with different skills. There are ones that uh, subspecialize in pediatric eye care uh, because baby eyes are not the same as adult eye, little adult eyes. There, I do glaucoma primarily. There are people who are retinal specialists. Um, uveitis specialists will deal with an inflammatory, non-infectious diseases of the eye. Um, some people do strabismus surgery where they're just working on the muscles lining up so you're not cross-eyed. Uh, there are subspecialty uh, practitioners with plastic surgery who do lid surgery and face and brow lifts and uh, tumors of the eye, people who've lost an eye to disease or are painful that need to be removed and they replace it with a cosmetic prosthesis. Um, Neuro-ophthalmologists who deal with uh, brain and other systemic diseases that uh, cause visual or ocular problems. So there are about eight or nine subspecialties where you can get additional fellowship training after your ophthalmology training. So, awesome, yeah. awesome. I didn't know there were so many, but it certainly makes sense. So I want to move probably from the most common to some of the more complex uh, diseases that we have, or I should say impairments. So, so there's dry eye floaters and tearing, right? So, uh, you know, I've had dry eye before, I've had tearing before, I've had floaters before. What causes that? What do you do about that? What is that about? Well, that's, that, that is a question that needs to be broken down. Okay, break it down, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's like asking me, I'd like to know a little bit about uh, amoeba, rocket ships, and tires. Okay, uh, you know, okay, all right. Three whole different chapters in the book. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about dry eye and hearing, mm -hmm. since they can be uh, one and the same. So the most common cause of tearing, believe it or not, is dryness of the eyes. Okay. The tear film is a very complex moisture layer that pr protects the surface of the eye. Um, it has very hard to replicate in a bottle uh, recipe of oils and proteins and fluid. Uh, but if it's not doing a good job protecting the eye, then you'll have trouble either with the way that you're seeing or with the way your eyes feel. So the most common reason people say they come in with their eyes tearing is because are, the, the tear film is not doing a good job. Mm. And that can happen because of medications that you take, which commonly cause dry mouth, dry eye. Mm -hmm. It can happen because of age, hormonal changes. It can happen because of other systemic diseases like thyroid disease or um, because you've had radiation on some body part. And so those are pretty common. Sometimes it's just older. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the problem is because of the quality of the tears. Other times you're just not making it fast enough. Mm -hmm. And so that is the, the idea. So generally dry eye trouble can be tearing. And when you tell somebody who's complaining of their eyes feel like they're going to water, you say, uh, yeah, I think your eyes are dry. Mm -hmm. They just want to slap you. <laughs> Wake up, doctor. I told you my eyes are about to, I'm about to run down my face. We're right. talking about my eyes are dry. Right. Uh, but that is the most common cause. Hmm. Certainly, there can be a problem with the tear drainage system. I got some visual aids, but there are some. Have you ever had a runny nose after you sobbed? If there's because it's after because I got a whooping. A, <laughs> <laughs> right. So in your eye lids, let me get my visual aids. This is what I do for the patients. Mm -hmm. So you, there is actually a complex tear drainage system. Okay. Well, if you can see that, yeah, there are little good. openings in the lower lid and the upper lid Yeah. where every time you blink, some of the tears move towards the nose and down that system little by little. Hmm. And so you could have tearing on one side constantly 
just because there's a clog in the tear drainage system. So that has to be, usually is a surgical fix for that. Mm -hmm. So floaters, on the other hand, generally come due to the inside of the eye. Hmm. This part of your eye is hollow back behind the front parts and you're born with a clear gel in there and it changes as you go through life. So you start off with clear jello and as it gradually begins to liquefy and things start to break down, proteins are able to slosh around in there. And if the light coming through the front of the eye is bright enough, it'll kind of cast a shadow in the inside back there and you'll pick that up as floaters. Hmm. So most people eventually have some floaters. Um, if they're just kind of, yeah, I see them. If the light's bright, I'm outside looking at a pretty sky, or then that's okay. If you are to have a whole bunch of new ones all of a sudden, and you're the only one at the table fanning, <laughs> all those gnats, and everybody's looking at you like uh, they need to call for some psychiatric help, then that could be a sign of trouble with uh, a, the retinal be, being torn or a retinal detachment could be a, a hand needs to be um, um, evaluated, especially if there are new things floating in your vision with flashes of light, like lightning strikes, then that could be a sign that there is something uh, changing that needs to be evaluated. Okay. Now, uh, how about uh, the sun's impact on our vision, right? So, uh, so I, I know some people wear sunglasses as a routine. I do because I'm, I'm sensitive to light. So, uh, so I guess it has, it's individual and has to do with the person's sensitivity. But would you say that wearing sunglasses or not impacts our eyes in any way? So I'm kind of a detractor on that one. Okay. There are people who believe everyone needs to wear sunglasses because of the risk of all these melanomas and um, the risk of cataract. Uh, all those things are multifactorial. Uh, I personally think that most of us got <laughs> more sun. We spend more hours in the direct sunlight without a sunglass or a sunscreen before we finish high school than we'll get the rest of our days. And so a lot of times the die has already been cast as to your risk of you know, wrinkled up skin or skin cancer or cataracts. But certainly um, a lot of us as we get older just prefer them. And uh, it certainly is not going to hurt. But at the same time, if you find them uncomfortable uh, or um, unwieldy, it, there's no reason to make yourself wear them. But uh, they probably are not hurtful, kind of like wearing a mask. Is few people are harmed by them. So. <laughs> Not harmful. Okay. So hyperopia and uh, myopia, and uh, better known as uh, uh, short-sightedness, far-sightedness, and uh, or nearsightedness and far-sightedness. Uh, so what is the cause? How does that happen? Uh, I tell you, it seems like you know they try to. You know, every time I go to the uh, optometrist, they say, you can't read that line. We need to adjust. We need to make an adjustment on you. So what, what, causes, what causes that? I was so insulted. I went to the DMV and I didn't have my glasses. They said, sorry, sir. You, I tried to read it without my glasses. They said, sorry, sir. You cannot drive. I'm going to put a note on your license. You cannot drive without oh, your glasses boy. on. And, and usually I don't wear them in the day. I usually wear them at night, but they, they put a ban on me. I say, oh, no, I, I don't, I, you know, I feel some kind of way about this. But, but explain to us about hyperopia and myopia. Okay. Well, the focusing system of the eye, like most things in the eye, are we've got a good idea about it, but it's, it's pretty impressive. Hmm. So I'm going to get out my little model here. Okay. So the focusing in your eye has to do with this is the film of the camera in the back. The back wall of your eye is the retina. It's actually transparent like saran wrap, but it's the film of the camera. And to get things in focus, the light travels through your windshield, which is called the cornea. It has a curvature to it, so it helps focus and bend light. And it works along with this other piece, the lens. It's clear, like a little clear lifesaver with no hole in it. Hmm. And a sucrets, maybe. So those two both have a curvature and a certain amount of focusing power. 
And so the light coming into the eye has to be bent. And if everything is in perfect focus, no matter where on the eye the light comes in, all the light kind of meets together just as it meets the wallpaper in the back. So if the light ray, if your eye is too powerful, then the light rays are bent too quickly and they focus in front of the retina. And by the time it gets to the back wall, the light rays are diverging again. That's what we see in myopia. Basically, your eyes are too powerful. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much you re re relax the zoom power of your eye, you're still not clear out in the distance. And that's also nearsightedness. That's the same as nearsighted or myopia. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we give actually glasses. You'll see on the, your prescription a minus number. So you think of it as decreasing how f the power of your focusing system to push that clear spot back down the, the highway. Hyperopia is the, the opposite. Your power of your focusing mechanisms is too weak. And so you're focusing on the down, you know, down the road. And so in order to see, you have to add some of that zoom power. Your, your zoom power just brings things closer to you. So if you're, let's say a perfect set of eyes was focused at a mile down the road. If you're a hyperope, a hyper your eyes may focus two or three miles down the road. When you're young, your zoom lens is like a National Geographic cameraman. It's huge. And you can see way down the street and right. you have the power to bring it up and see it touching right. your nose. Right. But right. that zoom power weakens every year of your life. Um, by the time you're about 40, you start noticing some changes. But if you're a hyper up, you may find that in your late 30s, or, you know, you just are starting to have up close trouble. Down the road, you have enough zoom power to bring it in. But it gets too close and you, you just don't have enough juice left. So that's a hyper rope. Okay. Usually they see everything when they're young. Around the late 30s, they start to have trouble. And then they need the reading glasses. And then pretty soon, even things in the distance are blurry. Everything is blurry. Mm -hmm. It's too tiring to keep it clear. Mm -hmm. And then there are the presbyopes. Basically, mm. these are the old eyes, people who can see down the street just fine. But eventually it gets too close. Hmm. The kids are like, ooh, look, look, daddy. Look what I see. And you're like, oh. <laughs> right, 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 right. You better hold it back. Come on now. <laughs> exactly. So that's a natural aging process called presbyopia. And it really kind of follows an age-related pattern of decline there. Okay. So I'm not The only one we didn't talk about is astigmatism. Okay, go ahead. So Hit that. Astigmatism. Astigmatism means that the eyeball does not focus to a point. Part of the light focuses maybe right here, uh -huh. and part focuses right here. Okay. It's just not nice and sharply focused. Okay. And so it's almost like having two prescriptions in one eye, and it could be corrected with glasses or contact lenses. Okay. Or sure. Very good. Well, I'm not sure if this was uh, ophthalmology or psychology, but, but my wife and I are just the opposite. And we have problems with watching television, so I need a little counsel. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds psychology. <laughs> Put your glasses on. Leave them alone. That's right. That's right. And a brother, a brother in the bed, he don't want to have to put on his glasses. I want to relax. I don't want to have to put on my glasses, right? But I guess I better keep peace in the household, right? Amen. A wise man did speak. <laughs> All right. Retro, uh, refractive error. What is that? Refractive error. We know it ain't good because it say error on it, right? Uh, what is it? Everything we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Hyperopia, myopia, astigmatism. It just means that your things are not focused perfectly. Okay. But just about everybody can have something measured in their eyes. Okay. But mo a lot of us don't need glasses for okay. everything. Uh -huh. so. Okay. For instance, us myopes, when we get over 45, we, uh, finally we can, we can still read the menu. Yeah, you know? yeah. Our, our friends are like, man. Right, right. <laughs> That's give right. Give me the special. That's right. I left my glasses. That's right. Home. That's right. So that we yeah. still, without any effort, can see up close. We sure. just can't see across the way. Absolutely. So all of that is refractive error. Okay. Then there is AMD, age-related macular degeneration. What is that? Help us. So the macula 
is the film of the camera, the retina, which is the part all the way to the very back back here. The, the macular region is the part in the middle, the part of the movie screen that serves your central vision. That's the macula. And so this is age related. So it's something of aging that degenerates. That region basically wears out faster than the rest of you. So it is something that is more and more common as you progress through the decades. One thing for a lot of us is melanin seems to be protective for, from the worst of age-related macular degeneration. Hallelujah. So we see it, it can be devastating because that part wears out and it cannot always be helped. Mm. So in a bad situation, it will not leave you in the dark, but it affects the central part of your vision. So imagine being able to see everything except right there. Looking in the person's face, you can see that their hair is messy and they got on a white shirt. But as far as seeing their face, no. You'll be able to go in the kitchen and get a bowl of cereal. But as far as seeing, you know, the dial on the stove or the oven, it's not good. So it's, that's the condition. It's very gradual, but there are two types of it. Usually it's slow. It's just not quite sharp in the middle. Your glasses don't work. And it just progresses very gradually. But sometimes the body tries to repair it. They call this uh, exudative or wet macular degeneration. And what happens is blood vessels, abnormal blood vessels, start to grow underneath the retina as if to repair it. The eye is remarkably made. It has types of collagen that are nowhere else in the body. Uh, there's five types of collagen in your body, you know, skin and eyes and teeth nails but in the eye there's a type that's not anywhere else and there's also blood vessels in the eye that are not in your skin or your gut these blood vessels don't leak out anything but when these new blood vessels start to grow they leak and bleed and they actually cause more trouble and so people start to have a week by week decline in their vision and left untreated it'll leave that blind spot right in the middle a scar so now there are treatments for that where they actually inject medication directly into the eye and it shuts down the blood vessels like Roundup and is able to dry up the fluid, the leaky blood vessels and stabilize and sometimes improve vision. Mm -hmm. So for our um, European friends, this is probably the number one cause of legal blindness in mm. retired uh, European people, people wow. of European. Wow, interesting. Ronnie Vanderhorst asks, can a, uh, AMD be reversed? Um, it can be treated. So we've seen if caught when it starts to bleed back there at an early stage, those injections are miraculous. They didn't have that 10 years ago. Okay. They used to just try to make your blind spot smaller. And if you want to see somebody really unhappy, somebody comes in with that condition and they used to say, well, the blind spot's going to be this big. And they would treat it with laser and it would be this big. Hmm. But the person was seeing before you lasered them and they will never be grateful that you gave them a blind spot. Yeah. And so now at least they have good treatment. It doesn't always work. And, but sometimes you have to have them frequently, like every month or six weeks. Um, okay. But that's the best thing we have right now. So every month or six weeks for the rest of your life? Sometimes. Now, they've got some new medications that have been developed that last for about three months. Mm. Um, some people, I, I know people have been doing them for four years. Wow. Um, sometimes it'll eventually burn out where they, they try to stretch them out. They do these same type of injections for other conditions. There's different medicines they put in the eye, but it can be used for diabetic related problems, for macular related problems, for strokes in the eye, different things. Hmm. Wow. I can't imagine getting a shot that often. I had a pterygium removed probably maybe 12 years ago, maybe. And um, just the idea of something holding my eye open permanently was a problem. <laughs> that, I couldn't blink. That was a problem for me, right? And then the idea that they were going to stick a needle in my eye at all, right? to numb it so that they could, you know, scrape the pterygium off was just 
that was horrifying. And I made it through and I was able to testify and, and share my experience with others and let them know that they weren't going to die. But the idea of that is uh, somewhat daunting. Um, so, yeah, that's well, I should say that when we when you're having the usual surgery, the needle does not go directly inside your eye. It oh. goes around your eye to numb up the nerve that serves your eye. OK. All right. So, yeah, they didn't put it in your eye. Now, when they do those injections, they actually put the needle directly in your eye. Yeah, that's so. what I'm saying. That's what I'm having a problem with. <laughs> <laughs> and it that. comes every three weeks or so. That's what I'm yeah, having a yeah, problem every, with. Every six weeks. But the truth is that people, uh, they numb you up really good ahead of time, and it's very quick. Okay. And usually, sometimes people are like, was that it? After the first one? Okay. Really? Okay. We're done. All right. Really? All right. All right. Okay, good. Now, I want to say here, since we're here, uh, we'll talk about a few other things. Uh, well, let's move on, and I'll ask it a little later. So cataracts. What is cataracts, um, and what percentage of the population gets that? Uh, is there anything that we can do to prevent it? Well, a cataract, first of all, is what we call the lens of the eye when it gets cloudy. So here's my visual aid here just like old times. So if you're looking at the front of the eye here, the windshield is your cornea. Mm -hmm. That's this piece right here. Mm -hmm. So that cornea is part of your focusing system and behind the iris color, there's another piece, the lens. So you're born with that, that's your zoom lens, your telescope for your eye. For most people, the cornea stays clear and functional their whole life. But in really everybody, this lens changes as you go through life for everybody. Nearly everybody develops some level of cloudiness of that lens as they go through life. Hmm. So the cat, everybody gets cataracts if you live. Hmm. However, only about half of us ever have significant disability from the cataract. So we don't necessarily all have to have cataract surgery. So usually there's three types of cloudiness and generally it just makes things blurry or causes glare or causes you to have double vision light like a, where now some of that can just happen because you don't have your glasses on. So you put your glass. Oh, yeah. But when you get to the point where the glasses don't work or it's, um, you know, I've had people with cataracts who drove a truck for a living and even though they were seeing 2020 under optimal circumstances they were like i'm dangerous i'm about to quit my job because i feel like i'm going to kill somebody so the time to remove the cataract really has to do with how it affects your life and there's no urgency for cataract surgery you take it out when you feel like it's more than i want to live with it's just too much to put up with mm -hmm. if they don't come back that lens of the eye will be replaced with a clear plastic replacement lens that also has some focusing power so at the time of cataract surgery, you can get back the clarity and the colors that have been distorted and dimmed with the cloudy lens. And as a bonus, you can get back to seeing without the need for your glasses again. Mm -hmm. They have different lenses now that can correct your astigmatism. Usually you have to pay extra for that particular lens because it costs like 15 times more than a regular lens. And there is our, another lens that's called a multifocal lens. So they can give you back the ability to see both far and near with, with these multifocal lenses. They're not perfect, but for people who hate glasses or have hearing aids that are always in the way or they're just vain, if they have an appropriate eye, then there is at least technology that can make you see like you're 30 years old again. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, excellent, excellent. I'm going to get back to... Um... Ronnie Vanderhorst had a follow-up question on AMD, and we'll come back to that <clears throat> since, right. we, since we progressed on. Um, another question, uh, color blindness. What, what causes uh, color blindness? So almost always color blindness is something that you're born with. Mm. The retina, the lining, the saran wrap that lines the eye, the film of the camera, has different cells in it. The ones that are most important are the, the rods and the cones. 
the cones are centered or, or very heavily populating the very center part of the retina. So they pick up fine detail, color, um, fine discrimination. The rods are not present right in the middle, but they start to show up as you get to your peripheral vision. And way out to the side, there are no rods. Um, and the rods are more helpful in dim light or to pick up motion so that if you see something picked up by the rods over here, your eye naturally wants to turn and use that central vision to identify what it is. So there are different subsets of the cones, the color perceiving uh, photoreceptors, the cells in the retina. And sometimes there's three different primary ones, just like the primary colors you live learn about in grade school. And it's very uh, intricate circuitry, but the way we see colors is just like the, you know, mixing paint in school. Something comes at the right wavelength, and because the right wavelength is appropriate, and these subsets of the cones are only stimulated if they say see green. And there's other ones that are only stimulated if they, they see, well, really it's blue and red and I think, yeah, I can't even remember the different ones, but I think there's red and green. Red, green is, is the biggest um, lack. So let's say there was a red and a, and a blue photoreceptor that both were stimulated equally, you'd see green. So some people are just born with no representation of one subset of those cones. And so they are unable to see certain colors. They may look at, say, if they have a problem with blue, then they're looking at blue, purple, it all looks the same to them. Uh, or they have, they're missing uh, green. So you're showing them this and then wondering how come it doesn't match. They literally cannot see that color. And so they always say, I'm not gonna, blue, purple, black, it's all dark to them. Hmm. There's nothing you can do about it. It doesn't really bother you. You see fine, you just don't see those colors. And so the only time it becomes important is for people who have their hearts set on working in aviation or maybe auto or nautical things where they use different light patterns to tell you if the plane is coming towards you or the plane is going after you out in the dark. And if you really don't see those colors, you're not suitable for that type of work. It's a danger to you. Okay. Otherwise, it's just more, you don't match your colors right with your tie. <laughs> hey, that's a real problem, though. That's an aesthetic be. problem. That's an aesthetic problem. But we know you don't have that problem because you're one of the best uh, dressers in all just, of North Carolina. <laughs> wear scrubs, man. Wear scrubs. <laughs> so diabetic retinopathy. Uh, how, how does that work? And, and, and what's the cure for that or the treatment for it? So diabetes is just becoming more and more common. So they say in the next 20 years, one out of three Americans will have diabetes. Wow. One out of three. Wow. Fortunately, everybody with diabetes doesn't have trouble. But the longer you have it, the more likely it is for trouble to show up. Hmm. That's why your family doctor, who now gets punished by the insurance company if you don't get your eyes checked, tends to send you every year to get it checked. Because the retina doesn't have pain fibers. And so if you wait until you're uncomfortable or you're not seeing well, you've waited too long. Because the retina, that saran wrap lining, cannot be replaced. It can sometimes be repaired, but you got what you have. And so the idea is to find trouble before it finds you. Mm. So generally we screen. And the best way to think about diabetic retinopathy is diabetes is a disease of blood vessels. The way it ages your eye is because it affects the blood vessels. As we mentioned earlier, there are certain types of blood vessels in the eye and brain that are not in your skin or your heart. Stuff that works to fix your skin or your, to prevent a heart attack, it doesn't work in the eye. And so what happens is the blood vessels either leak and those blood vessels that should only let out oxygen and fine micronutrients are now letting out cells and fluid and cholesterol. And so if that 
starts to become soggy, I like to call it, near the center of the vision, we call that a diabetic macular edema. And if there's certain criteria as to when you treat and when you don't, they call it a clinically significant diabetic macular edema. That's a, a phrase, a mouthful, but it means something to the eye doctor. It means the leakage of fluid and blood and cholesterol is close enough to the center of your vision that we should treat now. Hmm. And hopefully we catch it before you catch it. And so there's treatment with those injections or laser to try to seal up those leaky blood vessels and prevent loss of vision. The other way it affects the blood vessels is in your eye. If the circulation starts to suffer, the body becomes less efficient at delivering nutrition to the retina. And it's very highly metabolic. It needs its lunch. And so if it's getting kind of starved, it starts to send out a chemical SOS signal. Mm. It's called vasovascular endothelial growth factor. And there's different subsets of it. But basically, it makes things grow. Think of it like fertilizer. And so in your eye, if the circulation is poor, it starts to make new blood vessels. Kind of like if, if Highway 101 is on fire, you know, scary, you might get off on a side road and go get around the, the That's trouble. exactly what I did. <laughs> I did that. In, what was that? So in, June? in your eye. I did that in this, May or June. I, I remember the story. So in your eye, if the circulation is poor, the body starts to open up new highways. But these new highways are not fit for the eye. They are leaky and they are weak. And so they tend to make a mess of the retina. That delicate retina starts to get pulled on because it has uh, these blood vessels have a, a, a elastic quality. So they tend to distort and pull on things and leak out blood in your eye and just cause trouble. So those are problems that are highly likely to cause visual disability and blindness. Now, if you get these new blood vessels growing in there, there's laser and these injections. And uh, oh, about 10 years ago when that story about Jackie Robinson came out, Jackie Robinson died early of complications and diabetes. Mm -hmm. He went blind in one eye and he was one of the first people to have laser for this diabetic complication in his other eye. Mm. It was like at the 70s. And so we, you like to think that that saved him from not being able to see at the end of his, his days. But the laser, I think, is very helpful for the higher risk complications, the leakage, and some of these other complications. These injections have actually supplanted the laser uh, to manage those. Okay, good. So, so we know that uh, we can, through diet, exercise, etc., we can control our diabetes. <clears throat> Even if a person has it in their family genetics, uh, that's only about 10%, and so it can still be controlled. So it's not so much our you know, genetic code as much as often it's our zip code more than anything else, right? But so we, so, so we get that. So and we've been told for years that carrots, beta carotene and things like that. So what other kinds of supplements or nutrients do you think is helpful for us to take orally or to ingest so that we can have improved eye health and wellness? Well, the truth is just what you be, you're preaching and doing, what they've told us from our youth, eat your vegetables. The more colorful, the better. Um, and we know that different things change. You know, the recommendations for good health change. Sometimes we're supposed to take an aspirin. And they say, no, you quit taking that. <laughs> we look at the food pyramid from the 70s, right? Now they've um, turned that completely upside down. One thing you cannot lose on is eating vegetables. Carrots are good, but... The truth is that there is a, you know, you can get, if you're vitamin A deficient, then you could have blindness from that. But it's almost impossible, even eating at McDonald's, to be vitamin A deficient. So carrots are good, but not because it's a source of vitamin A. Uh, it's just because all vegetables are helpful and uh, healthful. And basically, if you're eating your vegetables, man, you are saving yourself from a multitude of, of problems. All right. 
Thank you so much. So let's move on to amblyopia. What is that? So amblyopia, so there's three types of amblyopia. Usually people call it lazy eye. Okay. The only ones yeah, we really... Yeah, we all had that friend in school, you know, before right. things got politically correct, you know. Back That's in the right. day, you talk about lazy eye, such and such lazy eye, but go right. ahead. Yes. So the one that we know the most about is strabismus. That's where there's a, a lot, misalignment of the eyes. They're both not looking the same way. One eye is drifting out or drifting in. That's strabismus. Right. So there are actually six muscles that move the eyeball around, and there's just one that's pulling too tight. Sometimes if you're, a, as a child, with that, if you're hyperopic, well, I'll just say, sometimes if you identify that as a child, it's just that the child at that point needs glasses. And you sometimes can cure their strabismus with glasses. Sometimes the strabismus can lead to amblyopia. So this is really what amblyopia or lazy eye means to us. Or okay. uh, It means that you're looking at two equally healthy eyes, and for some reason, one eye won't see. It's, or it's very poor vision. And that happens because something is keeping the two eyes from working together during the developmental years. So it could be that one eye is looking at mom and one eye is looking at the wall. Well, your brain is trying to take this vision and this vision, and it wants to just do that. Anything that keeps it from being able to lock in like a magnet, because your brain does that the first week, it, it causes your brain to have to choose. There's visual confusion. And so if this eye is drifting out instead of looking at mom, basically the highway between your eye and your brain is being paved during the from the time of birth to about eight, nine, 10 years old. So if something interrupts the paving of that highway, you'll end up with one eye that has normal vision, the other eye that doesn't. So if this eye has been drifting out and not being used, it might see a little bit, but it's not gonna be 20-20 like the other eye. And if it's caught later or fixed after you're 12, then even though it looks good in the mirror, it still doesn't see any better. Mm. It's amblyopic. Mm. Another reason for amblyopia is because one eye is just blocked. We got those other people in the hood from Fat Albert where one lid is just drooping half closed. Sleepy eye. Right. We call that ptosis with a P. And so if that happens as, a, you know, if it's me now, I get hit in the eye or an accident, my lid is drooping, it's cosmetic. Sometimes visual where I can pull it up and I see better. And so you fix that. But the eye underneath still is good. But if you have a ptosis as a child, then that can also keep you from paving that highway. And even though they lift the lid up when you're 15, you got high speed internet, internet over here, dial up over here. Mm. You got the you know, 60 inch plasma screen over here. You got rabbit ears with aluminum foil on the top over here. The quality of the vision is never good. Another reason more commonly where the kid looks normal, but they're sent in because they're not, the, they screened them at the pediatrician or the school. This eye sees without glasses, this one doesn't. If you catch it early and you find out that this eye sees without glasses, but this eye has a significant glasses correction, if you can give them the glasses and work with them to give this eye extra homework, you can get that paving done before the road is completely finished and there's no help really to improve it. So those are the three types of amblyopia, talking about the vision more than the appearance, but it's keeping the two eyes from developing together. Okay, very good. Now, in uh, 2012, you wrote a, uh, a paper, co-authored a paper on uh, Kara Cotonus. Uh, Kara <laughs> Cotonus, yes. And uh, so what is that uh, and, and how does that affect us? So that was uh, some research I was uh, involved in when I was in training. Keratoconus is a condition that affects the windshield, the cornea. And it usually strikes during your adolescence. Usually it gives you a really crazy glasses correction that has, it, in, and even when you get it, it, it just doesn't work very well. Sometimes it can be mild where glasses or contact will work. Other times your cornea is so distorted that you need a corneal transplant. 
So it's um, usually it, it, it manifests in the late teens or early 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know. Excellent. Excellent. So, so the eye is, is, is a particularly powerful uh, organ, right, for black people I know. Because uh, when I was growing up, everything would put your eye out, right? So, <laughs> boy, watch how you ride that bike. You put your eye out. You fall and put your eye out, right? right. You don't. You don't. You don't want to throw. You don't want to throw no rocks because you put your eye out. Of course, you know you could have an eye problem with that. Like not likely, but you could. Uh, you know everything is around the eye. So much, you know, around the eye. And so, with that, I want to ask the question of the diseases or conditions that we mentioned, or perhaps others. What are African Americans more likely to have, and what conditions uh, more readily uh, impact us as a black population? Well, first of all, why is it that we appreciate our vision so much? We need well, it. We need it. Why do we appreciate it? Why don't dogs seem to be, they're into their nose more than they are into their vision. And it's because the part, your eyes don't really do the seeing, your brain does. And so the part of your brain all the way to the back is called the occipital lobe. And about one third, well, it's like 25% of your whole brain is involved with vision. Hmm. And so when you think about how much real estate in the brain Mercy. is completely consumed with the color and spatial orientation and discrimination, we, I think that's why people will give up anything before they give up their vision. Yeah, my mother's um, concern was about 25% too. <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth is that you only have to know one person who was True. cutting grass True. and they hit that rock true and it hit something and it, and it put their eye out true true or you had one, one person, story just one story just one story <laughs> you know playing paintball yeah and it got hit in the eye right and now they can bear the you know yeah and you know you want to see somebody who's really sad right you'll see a guy had a patient little beautiful little 10 year old girl outside working with her dad putting up a fence didn't have on eye protection he puts the baby's girl eye out so now she can see the big E and, you know, wear the eye protection, wear the hearing protection because, it, and, you know, you see people, I've had patients, I've been a roofer for 40 years and I never wear eye protection until that one day that I nail in your eye and three surgeries later, you know, so got to say protect an ounce of protection. All right. Now on to what affects people of our, uh, from the African or dis dispora, diaspora or mm -hmm. our Latin brothers and sisters, non-whites. Glaucoma is the big thief. Mm. So glaucoma is notable because it doesn't hurt and it doesn't make you blurry. And so if you have symptoms for glaucoma, occasionally it could be painful, a little mild headache, but it's so sneaky. I've actually had people come in blind. Mm. I was playing with my baby girl and she was playing peekaboo and I was like, wait a minute. Mm. Wait I a can't minute. see. Wow. It was glaucoma. Wow. They had had a fist fight in high school. Now mm. they're 40 years old. You know, it cleared up after the swelling went down. I never wore glasses, so I never went and was off the eye chart. No bringing that vision back. Or sometimes, you know, you just don't worry. So that's the one thing we worry about. Glaucoma is a condition that affects the optic nerve. It's this cable that carries the vision from your eye to your brain. Usually inside the eye, there's a clear fluid that's produced, and it's under a certain tension. There is a drain. Well, beside the cataract, there's a little pump back there that makes fluid. And around the iris, there's a exit channel. The, the fluid does not mix with your tears at all. You don't feel it. But if something happens to your drain and the fluid that's being produced can't get out, the pressure will rise gradually in the eye. And if it's high enough, it acts as if it's choking out that cable, taking the vision to your brain. And the big problem is you can't replace that cable. Mm. And you can't even fix the cable. Wow. It is what it is. Wow. So when we identify glaucoma, our job is to just 
protect the vision that is there. Hmm. Any improvement in vision is a blessing. Uh-huh. So that's something that dis- you know, it, it affects us um, disproportionately. And about only about 1% of people will have glaucoma. So that's about 3.5 million people in the United States. But only about half the people know they have it. Mm. And so unfortunately, if you come in later, then it takes more heroic measures to try to preserve that vision. Right. Now, come now, in early, now, now, why is it that it affects black people more, do you think? Some of it is genetic. Okay. Some of it is that we just don't get caught, caught as quickly. But even in all Caribbean nations and in Africa, there's something genetic about us that tends to give us particularly um, severe consequences from glaucoma. Most people won't go blind, but if you look around the world for blindness that cannot be fixed. So most people in the world who are blind, it's because of cataracts. And with a 10 minute surgery, you can make them see and become productive citizens again. But when you find things that can't be fixed, glaucoma is like top two. Wow. Um, it's blindness and it's Stevie Wonder blindness. It's can't, you don't have what you need to fix it. Wow. So glaucoma is something that even if you don't wear glasses, when I see people who have severe glaucoma, I tell them, tell your kids who are 40, Go get that. Do me a favor for Mother's Day. Go get your eyes checked, even mm. if you don't need glasses, just so they can identify trouble while they still have good vision. Good point. Good point. So, so should we go once a year? We should go once a year. Um, not really. If you don't need glasses uh, or contact lenses, you know this is this is my personal. This is not sanctioned by anybody who wants to sell glasses. <laughs> but I usually have. Uh, you know, usually the kids get screened pretty well. So if you want to get your eyes checked once when you're in first grade or kindergarten, great. Sometimes I'll tell them to come, let me check the eyes when you graduated from high school. Thereafter, I say, come every 10 years, whether you need it or not. Hmm. Because usually you won't see them until they're 45 and they've never needed glasses. And all of a sudden, they're like, well, what? I can't see that. Now they come to get their eyes checked just to make sure. Um, some of them don't. They just get some reading glasses. But we just want to check the health of the eye. As long as it's something that glasses will fix, we'll wear them if you want. Don't wear them if you want. No problem. Uh, but you need some screening. And as you get older, you need to go more often. So Because stuff comes when you get old. Yeah. So usually in the 40s, if you don't need glasses, you know, come a couple of times. Usually I'll say the people have a family history. Come every couple of years, whether you need it or not. If you have diabetes, come every year or two, whether you need it or not. Um, when you get over, you know, 55, 60, you should probably be coming every one or two years, whether you need it or not. Yeah. yeah just that's to make that sure category you know. I'm in right there. Yeah. <laughs> one or two times category. every year, whether I need it or not. That's right. Yeah. If you got risk, go every year. If you got diabetes, yeah. go every yeah. year. If your dad's yeah. got somebody went blind in your family, just go. When you're over 65, you know, generally you just go every year. Yeah. Yeah. I just choose to be proactive, you know. I mean, it costs me, you know, uh, what, maybe 30 minutes to get there, maybe an hour in there, and 30 minutes back home, two hours to ensure, you know, my, my uh, health and wellness. So, uh, excellent. So, uh, so uh, Torrance, uh, Torrance says, uh, hello. Uh, and then let's see who else is asking hey. us. Uh, you know, remember Torrance Crutchfield. And, Torrance Crutchfield. Uh, yeah. yeah. So let's Chief see Crutch. who else. Uh, oh, back to Ronnie's question. So Ronnie Van Horst said he was told that getting a prescription for glasses uh, won't do any good for his AMD. And that was true. Why uh, didn't the prescription work? Why doesn't the prescription work for a uh, DM, AMD. So this, if you think of your eye like a movie theater, the film, the, the movie screen is the retina. And you, in the part in the middle is the macula. So most of us are not looking at the wide screen on the edges. We're looking right at the scene in the middle. And so this, if you have a problem with the middle, Think of it as if you're showing your movies on a wrinkled bed sheet instead of a 
instead of a fancy IMAX theater. You're, you're watching it on the side of the garage with aluminum side. And the picture quality is just not very good. So no matter what kind of camera you get, what kind of telescope you shine the image on that barn with, the problem is not in, in the lens. It's not in the camera. It's in the film of the camera. And if you had a good movie screen right in the middle, if we could repair that, you could restore the quality and color and disc discrimination that's missing. But if until we get an opportunity to replace that retina right in the middle, um, it just doesn't work. So, given my, I, I was we were laughing me <laughs> about you know uh, you know how we make lawyer jokes all the time. That was really common earlier in my life at one time. Until you get sued. Yeah. Or until there's a until there's a problem. That's right. You know, and you need a lawyer, and all of a sudden it's not funny. It's right. not funny at all. Right. Um, you can make plumber jokes. Right. About the way their pants sag. Right. <laughs> too much of, until you need a plumber. Now you say yes, sir. To thank you for coming. And so the, this is the, this is the problem with this eye problem, and we just need better things to repair. The retina, but that's why it doesn't work because that's not the problem. The glasses are not the problem. That's not why you're not seeing well. Uh -huh. And especially after cataract surgery, and you've done everything to the eye that you can, but there's still a problem there that we can't fix, and so it it limits. Mm. Your classmate, Dr. Rochelle Parker, says hello and happy Sabbath to you. She's Jody, she's enjoying the conversation. All right, let's see. I had another. My eyes about to go blind looking at these threads. Uh, let's see. So, uh, so we have a friend who says that her eyes started to have problems when she used, uh, blue tents, blue tent in her prescription. And she went to the doctor and the doctor said that the red tint would be better for her and not irritate her eyes as much. Had you heard anything, uh, along those lines? So that's so, that's tint in the prescription. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. So now that we are spending so much time in front of screens, there's a whole industry that has been developed around different uh, blue blocking lenses and tints and glasses to diminish eye strain and eye fatigue. Um, I, there is not a lot of strong science with that. So uh, I think that it turns out for a lot of people to be anecdotal, um, anecdotal per patient preference. Um, you want to make sure that your eyes are not dry because spending time on the at near work tends to put stress on that tear film. So if you're a person who starts off in the morning doing great, and then after lunch things to become difficult, and then by the end of the day you just want to close your eyes even if you're not sleepy. That is typical of eye strain, dry eyes. So lubricants, some extra omega-3 oils in your diet, or sometimes prescription eye drops, Restasis and Zydra, can be part of the remedy for that. Outside of that, the tint in your glasses is much um, preference. If sometimes people really in, who have problems with their eyes find that the um, that yellowish tint in the lens is very helpful. Hmm. Um, but if you don't have things, you know, you can wear it at night and day. So if you have problems with glare and sensitivity, it's uh, functional even in low light circumstances. But in great degree, those things with the tints in the lenses is just up to individual preference. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were talking about looking at screens. I developed my, uh, the onset of my pterygium was uh, in the seminary. I had a mono, uh, monochrome, those green monochrome screens that I did all of my typing on, and it was through, you know, eye strain. That's when it started to develop, actually. Does that uh, make sense based on the science? Well, uh, more commonly, we find that people who grew up or spent a lot of time outside in the sun and wind mm -hmm. or grew up near the equator. Hmm. If they're from Miami or Costa Rica or Mexico, and they spent a lot of time outside, 
whether they're golfers and surfers, um, it, despite how much you spend time outside, the closer you get to the equator, the more likely it is to show up. So sometimes even people in their teens, in early 20s, have significant pterygium, and you find that they immigrated from El Salvador or that they grew up in Miami or they're from the Caribbean. Or they were like my dad. Who I'm, was from a I'm from Watts. I'm from Watts. Maybe people who spend a lot of time outside. Uh -huh. So everybody's different, and there are exceptions to the rule. Yeah. The, the big risk factors are proximity to the equator, time outside, and the sun and wind. Okay. So those are the kind of people who generally get them. Okay. So the monochrome thing was not likely it then. Probably not. You might be. You're special, man. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. So, uh, uh, Elder Nola says her husband likes to watch TV with the lights off. Now, when I was growing up, they used to say, boy, turn that light on while you watch the TV. Your eyes go bad, you know. Uh, so she's asking, is that a problem with his eyes or can that cause a problem with his eyes? watching the television with the lights off or the room dark? Well, the truth is, um, no. Okay. It won't hurt your eyes. Okay. Now, if your mama told you to turn the light on or turn it off, told mama you to told you to turn, turn it off, <laughs> you might do better to turn, watch the TV with some ambient illumination. <laughs> but as, as far as hurting your eyes or leading to some serious trouble, then no, that won't, that won't do it. <laughs> Of all else, if in, in, if in doubt, right. listen to the woman in your life. Do what mama say. <laughs> say whether whether it's your right. children's mama or it's your biological mama, do what mama say, right? Do what mama said. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But don't worry about them uh, hurting their eyes. That won't do it. All right. Anymore. So, um, so Ella Shepard is asking the question, are there eye exercises that can help with sight uh, issues? Uh, a few years back, um, Ronnie Vanderhorst actually introduced me to a book. What's that book entitled? Vision for Life. I can't see the author's name right, then, right now, mm -hmm. but I'm sure uh, he can type it in. Uh, and he has a battery of exercise. I think I mentioned that to you, too, before. A battery of exercises wherein he has had good results with people having uh, corrections and reversals on some of the conditions that they've been experiencing. So in your uh, research, in your practice, have you come across things that people can do to improve uh, eye uh, wellness and health? So this is a field of endeavor that has really changed over the last 20 years with all these wars. So when I was training, um, it was really dismissed. I exercise except for very specific things in children sometimes. It was just poo pooed. But now, since we've had all these veterans come back from these wars over the last 20 years with devastating facial injuries, we have found that things we thought would not improve have actually responded to vision exercises. Um, amblyopic eyes, that this has always been my bad eye, but now it's the only one I have. And we have been able to I, witness plasticity with the neuro, neuronal system where things that were thought to be a lost cause have actually responded to those things. Some of it uh, has been very helpful. So I have to say that I am not trained and have no real expertise in that. But I do have seen enough examples that I uh, know that there are certain exercises, some of them computer-based, that have been shown to be effective in improving visual performance. Okay, good. How about uh, proximity to the television? Uh, Kenya uh, Gray asked about proximity to the television. We were told, boy, you get, get back, girl, get back from that television. You're too close. And besides, I can't see. You ain't made out of glass. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I think your big head was in the way, and I'm trying to watch the game. <laughs> Sit back, boy. You know, I, um, I think some of it, I'm not really sure about the radiation that these screens are, 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 are emitting and how that might affect our health over time, but that would be my only concern. It's okay. not going to do anything particularly clinical to the eyes 
But as far as our overall health, who knows? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is, especially if it's a kid, you just make sure they can see from the couch. Yeah. Some of them need some glasses sometimes. But yeah. if you've got normal vision, um, some of that is just pro- the proximity is kind of preferential. Okay. And again, if you're the woman in your life says sit on the couch, get up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so when I'm at the movie theater, right? So I've got that sweet spot. So I can't be down in front with the you know ha- with the handicap because that's too close. It's hurting my eyes in the front row. I can't see anything. It's too close. And then I don't want to really be too far back. I got my glasses on. I don't want to be too far in the back. There's a sweet spot right in the middle. So is that just a matter of preference, or uh, does that have something to do with our actual vision? Or both. I think it's a balance. Uh, it's probably both. Some of it has to do with your particular vision and your vision, your refractive needs. Some of it has to do with technology because if you do get too close to things, you just you can see the pixels. You need to back <laughs> up to get the real image the way it was designed to be. Certainly, a lot of that is is engineering driven. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, good. So your classmate Robin. Parker Langley says, no, Sakari, you was outside, the wind was blowing, and you was in Watts. <laughs> you know, leave, right. leave it to your classmates. Your classmates will fix it up for you, straighten you out. So uh, I got two questions, and thank you so much for chiming in, our audience. Let's see. Uh, let's see, Brother Ben, what can be done to correct and improve ret- Retina dysophrophy. Dysophrophy. Dysophrophy? Retina dysophrophy? Dystrophy. You see it? Oh, retinal dystrophy. Yes, ma'am. Dystrophy. Yes, sir. I didn't pronounce it right. Dystrophy. Yeah. So, a lot of these retinal dystrophies turn out to be in the family of macular degeneration. Okay. Um, some of them are, there are really no treatments for it. So there's so many different ones. One of them is like cone rod dystrophy. Um, there's Best's disease. There's retinitis pigmentosa. These are all dealing with the retina. So number one, you got to know that this is the only retina you have. And you're lucky if they have something that you can, that'll help manage it, fix it, improve it. Sometimes there's not. And so these are the kind of diseases in general that are likely to be uh, improved once we have better uh, translational medicine with things that are gene based or, um, you know, some of the electrical nanoparticle engineering feats that that are being worked on. So right now, it just depends on what specific retinal problem you have and if there's anything that's out there that's proven to be to be um, helpful. But the things right now that for me separate blindness from blurriness, truly cataracts can make you blind where you cannot get around. But because we can fix it, I just say you're blurry. But there are certain things that we cannot do anything about, and they tend to be the nerve tissue, the retina and the optic nerve, which is what glaucoma affects, those are nerve tissue. And, you know, the optic nerve basically is a part of your brain. That nerve goes from the eyeball through the socket and hooks directly into your brain. And so the fluid that bathes that back part of the nerve is the same fluid fluid that your brain and spinal cord float in. That's why sometimes the eye doctor can look in your eye and say, you need an MRI or Mm. this is an urgent situation. This is not just a glasses problem or a cataract. And these other symptoms you're having, this this needs to go to the hospital right now. It's because we can see that that nerve is being affected by something that just doesn't add up, needs to be evaluated. So um, the nerve and the retina are things that we struggle with and we have to just look to better technology, I used to say, well, you know, God, you made this one a little bit complex. Mm -hmm. So when I read those Bible stories about God healing blindness, I'm not thinking there were a guy who had cataracts. I'm thinking God went into these people's eyes. They were blind from birth. And he did a David Copperfield. 
Mm. He had y'all looking at the mud and the clay. Yeah. When he was doing something just yeah. ridiculously, he did. He used that Genesis one power to restore vision to a man who'd never seen before. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's retina and nerve problems. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, you know, the, 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 does the Bible say that? The, the eye is the window of the soul? Some, uh, if, if the Bible doesn't say it, it it's certainly a, a familiar adage. Uh, can, can you look at people as an as a, as a eye doc and say, Ooh, you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and look at their eyes and say, Ooh, you've been stealing all your life. You've just been stealing. <laughs> Uh, no, they don't teach you that. My wife can though. My wife is good at that. She but, got uh, discernment, and hey, she got that's that's some spiritual discernment that they didn't teach you in ophthalmology school, right? That's the truth. That's right. That's awesome. So uh, Kenny has a question. Um, he said, awesome presentation. Can you speak generally to the capacity of adaptive equipment to assist with activities of daily living for people who are visually impaired? Yes. So now these engineers, whew, they are coming out with all kind of visual gadgets. And so over the last five years, they've developed different eyeglassware. Well, we all remember the Google Glass came out, which was kind of a flop. But now there, there's a series of engineers working on these things. One of them is a pair of glasses, basically has two cameras in both eyes, and the images are then streamed or, or shown onto your retinas. And so it was developed by people who this person had college students in his family that were visually blind by a, a form of macular degeneration that, that shows up early in life and over the next 10 years he developed these glasses so that they could read natural print and now there's another one that's come out this is happening fast over the last year there's this pair of glasses that comes with an ear um, device even if you are Stevie Wonder you can put them on and it will read for you oh the menu says that we have avocado based dressing with uh, you know it will read to you in your ear where nobody is disturbed by it. And there are other things that are helping you with the vision, but there are other technologies that's really gonna give people some independence. They're working now with, um, you know, actually, you know, the, the eye doesn't do the seeing. The brain is where the vision happens. So they're working at trying to improve the connections between the eye and brain, bypass the problem. Some of it has been very invasive where they were doing neurosurgery to implant electrodes and stuff to your eyes. But I think as technology continues that there may be an opportunity to bypass the eyes and get visual information wirelessly to the part of your brain that processes information. They've done some and the person was completely blind and he was able to see like x-ray vision. It wasn't the vision we drew, grew up with, but he could see like shadows. He could say, that looks like you know, Sakari Thomas. Oh, I could tell by that nose. Or I could tell by the, your gait that you walk like my wife. And so there are different things that are being worked on. They're all very challenging and have their limitations. But there's stuff that's coming. And some of it's kind of expensive. But I know those glasses that were $20,000 is a half price now. And then there's these other prototypes that are $2,000. I have people in the office every week buying a pair of progressive lens eyeglasses for a thousand dollars. So if you're blind, two thousand dollars is nothing if it can make me read the menu when I go out to eat. That's true. So these these things are are improving, and there'll be an app on the in the Apple Store pretty soon. I bet. No doubt, no doubt, yeah. no doubt. Very good. So uh, last month was it last month? No, not for September. So August, August, uh, Dr. Uh, Milton Brown was on. And as you know, he talks to us. He comes on as our COVID consultant once a month. He'll be on next week, as a matter of fact. And uh, I think Brother Ben asked him, he said, if you were traveling, you know, what would you do as a precautionary uh, uh, measures? And he said, I would wear a mask and a face shield. So, um, so we do know that it, uh, in rare cases, 
uh, COVID is uh, contracted through the eyes. So what has your study yielded uh, about that? And what can you tell us about eye care in the era of COVID-19? Well, it turns out that because of the proximity that we have with our patients when we're looking into their eyes, that just after ER physicians and critical care pulmonary specialists came ophthalmologists and dentists as far as their risk of exposure. So in our offices, you know, we limit, first of all, who can come in the building. Y'all stay in the car, patient come on in. We have people that come in to clean things that people hold on to like handles and chair rails at lunch every day as well as at the end of the day. We clean everything after every patient. Um, trying to just limit exposure, limit opportunities to transmit. But aerosolized and airborne particles are the, the most serious. So the face mask is mandatory. We wear them. Everybody who comes in must wear them. And then we have a little shield that we have on the slip lamp while we're examining. It has been reported that COVID can be manifested in the eyes as a red eye problem, a conjunctivitis. In our experience, it seems as if that's not a presenting um, sign. What I mean is nobody's coming to the eye doctor saying, I feel fine, but my eyes are red. And then next week test positive for COVID. Usually they're already very sick if they're having the conjunctivitis. And so even though it can be spread that way, that has not been something that we clinically have been um, witness to or highly concerned about it. Some of us wear glasses, but I generally don't when, I, when I'm working because it impairs my, my ability to examine carefully, um, but I, all the other things we do. So I think basically possible problem I would do what Milton Brown tells me to do. <laughs> kind of like mama. But, huh? <laughs> absolutely. But I think that the main thing is to prevent exposure. And if we can all do that for one another, yeah, our eyes and everything else will be better. Okay. Well, this is the last question. Actually, the last question from the audience that we have today. And then I have one, one question for you. And this has to do with the uh, idea of iridology. And certainly not anything you were taught you know, in your regular medical school practices, and it tends to be more integrative or more holistic or um, naturalistic or whatever. Uh, so, it, and, and I've seen conversations about that where somebody said that's quackery, right? There's, it's not rooted in science or whatever have you. But what is your thought about it and uh, how do you relate to it based on your experience and your research? So I have only had um, anecdotal, anecdotal uh, exposure to that, and I, I have to just say that I think I am biased because I have been trained in Western medicine, and but I do now find that there are things I simply wasn't exposed to that work. Now you know a lot of the physicians are um, are brought up in the osteopathic tradition. They're deal medical providers and they do different things with manipulation i think that for all um treatment getting the appropriate diagnosis is is a prerequisite to getting the appropriate treatment um, and i at this point just am not able to really comment on the power of of um, iridology as far as a diagnostic tool. Okay. Uh, I've heard people <laughs> give their stories about they looked in my eyes and they said, you know, your liver is not... Right, and, right, you right. Know, it, it just right, sounds right. absolutely fantastic to me. Right. But I think the it's thing to do It's almost prophetic, be, right? It's almost like a word of knowledge. <laughs> I, I really don't know. I, I'm, so I try not to be unnecessarily dismissive of it. But for me, Example, when people come to me and they say, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, I stopped my eye drops for my glaucoma, but I've been smoking that weed religiously. Religiously. Check my eye pressure. Yeah. Well, we check it. Right. And if, the, if it's not doing well, I'm like, okay, this is not working. Mm. 
if it was working and you preferred to smoke smoke this imported weed now we've tested you know hickory the hickory supply you got to get it imported from some different soil or something these right, woods are right. not going to provide right. the chemical necessary to manage your glaucoma but we tried they said no no they said this will work well let's try it and measure and see if it works yeah and so if somebody told me that your liver your liver is having problems well i'll be trying to go get some liver tests and maybe an mri or ct to try to confirm that mm -hmm. so that would be a way for me to develop an appreciation and and confidence yeah. in, in those skills. But yeah. those are examples of, you know, things that you can evaluate for, for yourself. Cool, cool, cool. And I'm glad you said it like that because we know that there's what's taught in conventional medicine, you know, uh, curriculums. We, we, you know, we, and, and we get that. I asked my doctor, I asked my doctor, well, what can I do a bit like that? He said, I don't know what to tell you. I said, well, well, what's the cause of that? He said, I, I don't know, you know. <laughs> he had no answers for me. You know, that was unacceptable. But uh, so, so my approach is integrative, really, right? So do, let, and as you said, do, let's do the naturopathic, the holistic approach. And let's test it, you know. Let's test it with the science. What is the science saying when we look at uh, our next lab, our next round of labs, what, 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 you know, so I, uh, I, I think, you know, cause I think God gave us, I think God gave us both. Right. Uh, and to the extent one or the other doesn't impair us or make, make us worse. I think they can be very helpful, helpful to us. Last question. Last question. How does, how has your faith informed your work? Uh, generally speaking, and maybe on a day to day basis, what would you say to that? Well, I think that one thing, we're all on this spiritual journey, and uh, I just recognize <laughs> that, you know, work is such a blessing for me. Um, I think, though, there's just a blessing in being able to create order out of chaos, hmm. beauty out of disarray. So maybe your your calling is for music or gardening or cooking or painting, but whatever God has given you to uh, make the world a better place um, it is a blessing to you. I also have learned that um, it's a privilege to do things that God that people appreciate. I, I think in medicine, the thing that's so helpful for some of us who are not noble on the inside is that things that align for our benefit also incentivize us to do, do well by somebody else. So for instance, some days you're just into things, but you just have these experiences where, ah, I had this old lady who was sitting in the chair and we were making preparations and she told me that she had cancer and that, you know, she probably wouldn't be back for her next appointment because she had decided she wasn't going to take the treatments. She said, I've taken care of too many people with that chemotherapy and I've decided to go visit my people down in, in wherever, Texas or Arkansas. And then she said, her, her visage changes. She said, I've just decided in my spirit that I'm going to live every day that God ordained me to live. Mm, mm, mm. <gasps> The room just changed. Yeah. And so, you know, just pray for me, she said. So mm. we stopped right there and we prayed. Awesome. And when I saw her obituary come by, you know, all I could think of is there was a soldier right there. Yeah, yeah. And other times we'll have people who just need you to listen. And I yeah. can just simply listen. Yeah. And other times I had these deaf patients. I've had a series of deaf patients. And um, she had already lost one eye to glaucoma. We had to do surgery on the other eye. She comes back at a month after everything's looking good. And she said, you know what? The other day I was driving down the street and I saw at the end of the horizon, the mountains, and I started crying so hard. I was so grateful to God. I had to pull over to the side of the street. Mm, mm, huh. And mm. so she was there in our chair just saying, thank you so much for restoring this gift of sight. Because if I can't see, yeah. I can't talk. Yeah, I can't yeah. communicate. Yeah. 
and she had tears coming down her sh- and I was just like, you know, basically, you know what, what you're able to give is what enriches your life, not what it, what you get. Yeah. And so God is using this gift of ophthalmology to, you know, we go on mission trips and we see people who don't have any money, but they got family and they got faith and they have community and they are just so gracious. And, you know, they come back and they bring you some eggs because they can see or some oranges, and it just makes you recognize ah, that God is giving you something that you can give, and that is how you measure a rich life. Amen. And so I don't have a lot of talents like some of y'all, oh, but brother. I've been given this, oh, brother. this training. Oh, brother. I've been given this thing. This is a tool that God helps gives to me, so I'm just so, I just see his hand, and it's not what you do, but the spirit in which you do it. It's not what you give, but the spirit in which you give it. Good and stuff. so God is helping to grow me up to be a better person because of the, the gift of cataract surgery, ocular surgery. So that, that's my testimony today. It's just a blessing to go to work. Good. And uh, <laughs> we were out for seven weeks uh, during the COVID, we had shut down. So I, I was pretty sure at that point that I'm not ready to quit, Lord. If I yeah. Know that. Yeah. So, thank you. Gave you some appreciation. Well, awesome, uh, uh, Reverend Harris. We uh, <laughs> we appreciate your ministry, uh, the yes, ministry sir. of eye care and all that you do. And uh, you're also a good husband. You're a good father. You're a good bass. You're a good baritone. <laughs> At a soloist from time to time, so we appreciate you. Fantastic information, and uh, we will not uh, no longer castigate and marginalize ophthalmologists and eye doctors because we need them so much. And we appreciate you for stopping by and sharing this good information with us. All right, well, thanks again, uh, Doc. Please give Nicole our regards. Bless you, and uh, Thank you so we'll much. talk to you soon. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So um, we uh, definitely appreciate um, um, we definitely appreciate um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Harris coming by and blessing us uh, in that way. I also wanted to uh, let's see. I wanted to remind us about um, let's see. We've got uh, Dr. Dr. Brown coming by tomorrow uh, next Sabbath. So. Please don't uh, don't forget that Dr. Uh, Brown will be by with us tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but next Sabbath, and he's going to be talking to us more and giving us an update on um, update what's going on with uh, with COVID, what things can we expect. Uh, he's in D.C., so he might be able to give us some insight into what the president's dealing with and going through. And I'm certain while we even while we've been on this call, there have been various updates and conversations and conversations and conversations. And uh, so we'll continue to pray about that. So uh, in closing, in closing, I just I was thinking about uh, I and how important the I is uh, to God. Uh, so important that uh, in John and, and I think. Um, Dr. Harris alluded to it. He was talking about the story when the man's eyesight was actually healed by Jesus. And, and so we know that uh, the eyesight is important to us, um, and so much so that Jesus actually took time to heal it on more than one occasion. And so that's the physical eyesight. And then I also looked at uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, and and uh, this is a message to the Laodicean church. And uh, Jesus says in verse 18 of Revelation chapter 3, I counsel you to buy from me gold, and that's faith, uh, refined in the fire, right? Uh, that you may be rich uh, and white garments, that's righteousness, that you may be clothed from your shame and your nakedness, and, it, and that uh, it may not be revealed, and that you anoint. And that's, when it says anoint, that has to do with oil, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, that you anoint your eyes, that you anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you might see, right? And so even as we have all uh, declared that our eyesight is so important, 
uh, so necessary. Our spiritual eyesight is, is critical. Uh, I was kind of laughing about, are you able to see certain things in that person when you look in their eyes? Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Harris said no, but his wife Nicole could. So which means that she has this very uh, spiritual discernment. So, uh, so, so we can't say enough about spiritual vision, spiritual vision. Take care of your physical vision, but make sure you have spiritual vision because that will teach us how we get to point A to point B. Spiritual vision is actually fueled by faith, really, so that our spiritual vision can see what our physical eyes cannot see, can take us places where we can't physically go, can cause us to manifest things that we don't even know how we can get there. The scripture says, eyes have not seen nor ears heard the things that are prepared for God's children, right? So I want to encourage us to invest in your eyes, in your eye care, but also invest in your spiritual eye care so that you can see things that others cannot see, so that you can see in the spirit realm like no others can see, so that you can detect a demonic presence that comes into your sphere and, uh, and, and in, if need be, you can go into spiritual warfare, do deliverance, cast it out or whatever have you, but you've got a special anointing, special anointing so that you can see in the invisible. And that's something God absolutely wants us to have. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time we've had together in these last uh, couple of hours. And we thank you for Dr. Harris. We ask that you touch those, those hands as they operate on those delicate eyes. Give him, O oh God, the capacity to minister as he goes and to, and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, even when he doesn't utter a word. We thank you. Thank you for every caller. Those who may even be suffering with some kind of eye malady in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would go through the airways and through the electronic ways and touch eyes even now so that folks will call in next week giving testimony of God that you, that you repair their eyes, the pain that they had, the vision impairment. God is no longer an issue. You're more than able to do it, and we trust you in the name of Jesus. And so I pray that you would go through and touch every eye in the name of Jesus and, and, and remove the refractive errors of each, uh, of, of each person, O oh God. And we pray that this, this coming together would not just be a, 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 a knowledge-gaining, learning experience, but also would be a supernatural experience so that we would be healed, delivered, and set free by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We thank you, God, for hearing and answering these prayers in the name of Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. Until next week, we look forward to seeing you next week when we will have Dr. Milton Brown speaking to us on our update for COVID-19.